Uh, also, uh, is Nigeria's public death, public debt, a point of concern for you? I mean, recently uh, there was a statement released by Musa Faki, who is the chairman of the African uh, Union Commission. He said that debt relief is an urgent imperative for many African states to give them vital economic breathing space. So, do you think Nigeria needs to seek some form of debt relief to free up more resources uh, for uh, national development? Well, I think so, because the burden of debt, I mean, our debt now is, I think, close to 121 trillion or so. That burden is huge. And when you look at the cost implication of servicing those debts, it deprives the economy of investment in some very critical infrastructure. And sometimes it could be very suffocating. So it is not out of place for us to seek relief where we can get the reliefs. It's not out of place. But the good thing so far is that we have been seeing a recalibration of the distribution of the portfolio of debts. Because if you look at our external debt, the bulk of it are multilateral debts which is about, uh, I think, 40% or 45%. Our multilateral debts are generally more concessionary. Their interest rates are often not too high, and their tenors are very long. But we must commit those debts to tangible projects that can help to strengthen the capacity of the economy to be more productive. Then we have bilateral debts. Bilateral debts are debts from you know, all these Chinese loans and all of that. A lot of them are also committed directly to projects. They are not debts that you collect and you throw into the Federation account and you begin to spend. No. That is one beauty of some of these bilateral debts. And bilateral debts, as we speak, is about 14% of total external debt. The one that's a bit disturbing is the commercial debt. That is the euro bond. That one, you, can, you hardly can negotiate that. And the, the interest rates are a bit high. But the government has been re rebalancing the portfolio, which is good. Because it seems to have more domestic debt now than foreign debt. Domestic debts are easier to manage, but again, we talked about the issue of cost of governance and all of that. If the bulk of that is also going to servicing the apparatus of government, it's of concern. So we need to take a critical look at the expenditure profile to ensure that even when we are taking this facility, either externally or locally, we are committing it cost effectively and we are targeting things that can help grow the economy, particularly infrastructure. See, I'm still concerned that the proportion of our budget that is going into infrastructure is still very low. Because it is not everything we call capital project that is infrastructure. Okay. Sometimes all these computers, vehicles, and all of that, sometimes they are classified as capital projects. It can be misleading. There's nothing wrong if you are spending 50% of our budget on infrastructure because that is what will help productivity. That will help to create jobs. You talk about economic diversification. That is what will help to diversify the economy. So we need to, we need to take a critical look at this allocation and, 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 and also you know, reduce the amount of resources we spend on the apparatus of governance. That is very, 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 very important. Dr. Yusuf, let's go back to uh, the, challenge, the challenges bedeviling the petroleum sector, especially this recurring decimal, fuel scarcity. Uh, what do you think is wrong with our sector? Well, as I said earlier, one of the sectors that has suffered the worst form of governance over the years is the oil and gas sector. 
unfortunately. And that's a sector that could have easily pulled, at, pulled us out of all of this mess. That's a sector that we'll have leveraged upon to leapfrog into a higher level as, as, as a developing economy. But unfortunately, the sector was mismanaged. From a policy point of view, from a political point of view, from criminality point of view. So, the new, the current administration is in the process of resetting the sector. We need to make the processes more transparent. You now have a Petroleum Industry Act. It may not be perfect, but it's far better than what we used to have. We now have a lot of commitment of the administration to incentivizing investment in gas. We have more gas than crude oil. And that's a huge market for gas. The government has rolled out quite a number of incentives to get more you know, investors in the gas sector. The government has also thrown a whole lot of resources into combating the problem of criminality in the oil and gas sector, especially in the oil producing areas. We are not there yet, but some progress is being made. So we have issues around policy. We have issues around governance generally. But I must say, this has been a cumulative problem. We have, over several years, people who are getting oil blocks who have no idea about what petroleum industry was all about. And these are huge assets of, of, of the country that belongs Dr. to the Yusuf, people. You, you just called for transparency. That is what has brought us so to this point. Are you on the side of, you just called for transparency. Um, so I'm asking, are you on the side of those calling for, the, for a total overhaul of the oil and gas sector? Of course, of course, we need an overhaul. You cannot be doing the same thing and expect a different result. We need an overhaul, but there is a challenge. The challenge is the political economy con component in energy pricing, particularly petroleum products. Because I must be frank with you, we cannot completely deregulate the PMS for now, completely deregulate it. It's extremely difficult in the current social environment. Given the current state of poverty and given the impact of petrol pricing on the citizens, we cannot walk away from it completely. So in an attempt to do that, a lot of abuses come into it, but we can, we can, we can work out a framework for it. So what, what, what kind of we can framework make the whole process you, Dr. Yusuf, what kind of framework uh, would you advise the government to put together? Because you mean, overhaul, the center's overhaul is now, now sounding very generic and quite cliché. Now, now, you know, when we talk about overhaul, the issue of management of the place. That is one issue. We need to ensure that we put in place a management that can that should be more transparent or can increase the level of transparency. Secondly, we need to disconnect the political, uh, the political players as much as possible from the sector so that the sector can run professionally. We need to reduce the influence of bureaucrats on the sector so that the sector can run professionally. Then the political economy component of it. If you had to set aside a budget for subsidy yearly that will cap at a particular level that, okay, uh, this year, this is, we, this is our subsidy, subsidy budget. We are not going to go beyond it. We can designate some stations. It could be NPC stations. I say for this year, we are budgeting two trillion. So that for those stations, they will not sell fuel maybe more than 500 naira. Of course, there will be a long queue there. But those who will go and queue are not the elites. They are not the people who are already, who are using the kind of SUVs that you see, the, the, the modern SUVs. They will not go and queue. 
when someone can go and buy at the at the market price. But let's create a window for the vulnerable segments. To say that if you are coming to this station, first you are not buying jerry cans. Second, we are not selling more than 30 liters for you, but we are selling at maybe 500 naira. That is government intervention for the vulnerable segments. And for people who are struggling, they don't mind to keep for five hours to be able to buy that kind of thing. We can have that all over the country. The state government can also designate some stations where they can sell subsidized fuel. It is the poor people that will go and kill. The big guys will not kill. All these managers and top guys in the banks or in the telcos, they will not go and kill. They don't have the time. So that way, we find a way to distribute. I mean, we could, have, we could be more creative. Mm. But we have to restore quality governance into the, into, into the oil and gas sector. We already have MOFI, Ministry of Finance Incorporated. They are doing some work aggregating government assets. But we need to insulate all of these things from political interference, from interference from the bureaucracy. That is the only way it can work. So that is the framework, that is the kind of right. framework I think we can, we can put in place. I mean, look at what is happening with uh, NLNG. After all, it's, it's working well. They are giving dividends, they are very professional. We haven't had any serious scandal around them because they are professionally run. The same thing can right. happen with, with, uh, with NMPC. If you create the right kind of governance framework. Right. Because of time, let's quickly talk about price stability. Because, you know, CBN has deployed several monetary policy tools and instruments to achieve uh, price stability. But despite the deployment of these tools, the inflationary pressure has persisted. Are you on the same page with those who say to succeed, the CBN must independently pursue inflation goals? I mean, for most Nigerians, they do not understand what this means. What does this mean in a layman language? Well, it's inflation targeting, or inflation goal, as you put it. And the whole idea is to make sure that monetary policy instruments are focused to achieve reduction in inflation. That is what it means in layman's language. But we have been pursuing that policy for several years, even under the previous dispensation of the central bank. How much have you succeeded in bringing down inflation? Mm. The key drivers of inflation are issues of cost. Increasing uh, or reducing or increasing interest rate is not going to bring down the cost of diesel, the cost of gas, the cost of transportation. It's not going to bring down the cost of your clearing of cargo at the port. It's not going to bring down your import duty that you are paying. All of these things are fueling costs and they are fueling inflation. So there's a limit to which we can depend on these CBN instruments. As I said earlier, we have overstretched these monetary policy tools. And that is why I'm glad about what the government is doing by transiting to the use of fiscal policies. But we need to expedite that. Fiscal policies to reduce taxes in some critical sectors, to waive VAT, to reduce import duty, so that the costs at which entrepreneurs are getting their inputs will be reduced. And invariably, this will transmit into lower costs of, of, of goods and services. That's for me, I think, right, is the way to go.